inspires me to write? I have no idea. I've been interested in, in stories since I've been a little boy. I grew up in a family of storytellers. Uh, my grandfather was a Chicago policeman from the Al Capone era to the anti-Vietnam War protest era. My grandmother worked for the old Chicago tabloid newspapers. And so from the time I was a little boy, I was told wild stories about criminals and crimes and danger. And uh, it's probably uh, a family inherited a trait because everyone in my family has always told stories since I was a little boy, and it's probably something I just inherited. You start by introducing the first of our two uh, distinguished authors today, Howard Willens, an attorney, author, and historian who has practiced law in both the public and private sectors in Washington, D.C. He received his undergraduate degree in political science from the University of Michigan and his law degree from Yale Law School. After military service, he entered private practice, but soon thereafter went into public service. He served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice from 1961 to 65, Assistant Counsel to the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy from 1963 to 64, and Executive Director of the President's Commission on Crime in the District of Columbia thereafter. Mr. Willens was retained by the Northern Marianas people in 1972 to represent them in negotiations with the United States regarding the terms under which they became U.S. citizens and a commonwealth under U.S. sovereignty. He continues to represent the commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands and served as special legal counsel to the governor during 2006 to 2013. He is currently, or was a partner in the law firm of Wilmer Cutler and Pickering from 1967 through 94, and he continues to practice law and consult as managing director of Wilsey Company LLC in Washington, D.C. And today, if I'm getting this correct, is the only living member of the three-person supervisory staff of the Warren Commission. That is correct. Okay. Mr. Willens joins us today to discuss his most recent book, History Will Prove Us Right, inside the Warren Commission report on the assassination of John F. Kennedy which is described as a superbly written account by someone who knows precisely what needs to be said and how to say it, as well as an account which deserves close and careful scrutiny by anyone interested in the Kennedy assassination. Uh, our, our second author joining us today is James Swanson. James Swanson is the Edgar Award winning author of the New York Times bestseller Manhunt, the 12 day chase for Lincoln's killer. In 2009, Newsweek magazine Patricia Cornwell named Swanson's Manhunt and Truman Capote's In Cold Blood as the two best nonfiction crime books ever. It's quite an honor. <laughs> in 2006, Entertainment Weekly magazine named Manhunt as one of the 10 best books of the year. Mr. Swanson has degrees in history from the University of Chicago, where he was a student of John Hope Franklin and law from the University of California, Los Angeles. He is a former senior fellow in constitutional studies and former editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. He's held a number of government and think tank positions in Washington, D.C., including at the U.S. Department of Justice, and he serves in the advisory council of the Ford's Theater Society. Today, Mr. Swanson joins us to discuss his most recent work, End of Days, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy, right here, pick it up, which reviewers have called a fresh modern contribution to the literature about one of the most heartbreaking crimes in history and crediting Swanson with making history read like a crime thriller, vividly recreating the details surrounding the shooting through the perspectives of the killer, the victim, and those closest to him. His treatment of Dallas 1963 is a grand narrative at its finest. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Mr. Swanson to tell us a little bit more. Thanks, Tom. And I guess uh, Howard and I will each speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll go to our, our conversation. So November 22nd, 1963. Do you remember? I, I see that many of you do. And I'm sure you could tell us exactly where you were when you heard the news, what you did. Your teachers told you, your parents told you, your office mates did. You listened to it on the radio, you watched the coverage on television. I actually do remember November uh, 1963. Uh, I was four years old. I don't remember the assassination of the president at all. I, I have no idea what I was doing on November 22nd. Obviously, I was at home with my mother during the day, but I don't remember that day. But I do remember that weekend, my mother said these words to me. She said, Jamie, get dressed. It was in the morning. Get out of your pajamas. Get dressed. The girls are coming over to watch television. Now, the girls were two neighbors across the street, age 7 and 10, two sisters. And they were the, the children of a very conservative Greek immigrant family. Uh, the man was, was a uh, grocer, uh, worked all hours of the day and night, and decided his girls were going to go to Harvard. 
Uh, one actually went to Harvard Medical School, the other was a failure and went to the University of Chicago, my college. <laughs> but uh, as part of his program for their education, they were not allowed to own or watch television. And so uh, they were sent to our house. And I said, coming over to watch television, why? Why are they coming? And my mother said, because the president is dead. And we're going to watch a horse-drawn carriage take his coffin down Pennsylvania Avenue. And soldiers will carry him up the steps of the US Capitol, where hundreds of thousands of people will file past his coffin. I remember that morning 50 years ago, like it was last month or last week. The memory is so vivid of, of my mother telling me that story. I write books about things that have seemed to have always obsessed me since I was a child. Certainly that was the case of the Lincoln assassination. And th this was also the case with the Kennedy story. It was a very personal story to me. I know I began writing this book in a way when I was eight years old. And I uh, went into my mother's sliding door closet, which she called her morgue, because she was a painter and she kept source material there. Uh, postcards, old prints, drawings, vintage photographs, all kinds of material. And one day I found her collection of materials from the Kennedy assassination, the Life magazines, the Look magazines, uh, the copies of the Chicago Tribune where I grew up. And I started paging through them when I was eight years old. I remember paging through the Life magazine and looking at the frames of the Zabruder film, looking at the photographs of John Jr. saluting his father's coffin. And I knew that this was an important and, and, and historical event, but I, I didn't know who John Kennedy was when I was eight years old. But when my mother came and saw me looking at these materials, I knew from her tears that something terrible had happened. And so that's really how I first got interested in the story. And what I try to do in the book is, uh, first, I decided what not to do. I did not want to write a book uh, bringing up and rejecting or analyzing every conspiracy. My friend Vincent Bugliosi wrote a wonderful book uh, reclaiming history over a thousand pages long that I commend to anyone uh, for that exercise. Uh, he did a brilliant job. What I wanted to do is take people back in time with the hope that if they read my book they would know what it was like to be living in America on the day John Kennedy died. I really wanted it to be a time tunnel. The, the way I did not manhunt, I wanted people to feel what it was like to be living in America in April 1865 when the war ended and Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And so my objective first was to, to take you back to that moment so you'd know what it was like to hear that the president had shot, to those four days of, of the nonstop news coverage and how it changed the country in so many ways. So that was the first thing I wanted to do. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do, because the story is so vast and can be so incomprehensible, that I decided I really wanted to focus on three principal characters, President Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald and Jacqueline Kennedy. Because in my mind, this was very much her story too. The president's life ended in Dealey Plaza, but her life as she knew it to that time also ended that day. So I decided that she would have to become a very important character in the book because she certainly carried on the president's legacy and she was instrumental in deciding how we remember John Kennedy today. So that's part of the book, too. It's really in three parts, the before, the during, and the after for all three of the characters. And so I try to interweave their stories. And what I try to do most, uh, I try to let the reader know who, the, the real, who I think the real Lee Harvey Oswald was. And that's why I begin the book with a little known episode. Uh, seven months before he killed President Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald attempted to assassinate a U.S. Army general in Dallas, Texas with a, a nighttime sniper attack. And most people don't know that or they don't remember that. So here he is seven months before he thinks of killing President Kennedy. He's attempting to murder a man for the first time in his life. And to me, this is a template that reveals so much about Oswald's psychology and his personality. He reveals himself to us as a cold-hearted man who will murder someone with a sniper attack. He failed because the bullet nicked part of a window frame and missed the general's head by an inch, but it emboldened Oswald. He learned that he could 
try to kill a man in Dallas and get away with it. He mocked the police. They couldn't figure out who the would-be assassin was. He, he said to his wife, I can't believe I missed. I, 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 my bane was perfect. It emboldened his sense of superiority and smugness that he could get away with something. And so long before he ever tried to kill John Kennedy, he revealed himself to be a murderer, a sneak, a creature of the night. And so I, I begin the book with Oswald to let you know right up front who this man is. And of course, I, I take you through the life of John Kennedy, including the terrible irony that that morning in his hotel room in Fort Worth before he flies to Dallas, when Jackie's in the room, Dave Powers, Ken O'Donnell are in the room, and he says, you know, somebody in a tall building could just shoot me with a rifle and nothing could stop him. Little did he know, as he said those words, that man was already in that tall building in Dallas. And then, of course, I, I take Jackie through her four days of the funeral procession, uh, the cathedral, uh, creating the myth of Camelot. So in a nutshell, I, I try to tell the story in a very human way. Uh, I do address the conspiracies briefly at the end because I certainly want the reader to know what I think. But what I hope is, by the time you get to the end of my book, you'll say, what a, what a thrilling and sad story. And by the way, isn't it obvious that it really was Lee Harvey Oswald? Thank you. Mr. Willens. Yes, uh, I remember where I was uh, indeed on that day, uh, uh, November 22, 1963. I was out having lunch at a, a nearby hamburger joint next to the Department of Justice. I was a deputy uh, to the head of that division and had served for about two and a half years at the time. As we were going back to the department after a late lunch, a young criminal division lawyer charged in our direction saying the president's been shot. So my boss, uh, Herbert J. Miller Jr. of Maryland, who ran for lieutenant governor in Maryland once, uh, several decades ago, quickened his step, which is to mean we started running, uh, and he went up to the attorney general's office and he found the attorney general secretary in tears. The attorney general was at his home in McLean entertaining the U.S. attorney uh, from, from uh, the, the Southern District of, of, of New York. So that was the beginning of the question as to what role the department was going to have, if any, in investigating and prosecuting this case. But the fact is, there was no law in place at the time that made killing the president on the streets of Dallas a violation of federal law. So if Ruby had not eliminated, silenced, as we say, uh, 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 Oswald, uh, he would have been prosecuted under the laws of the state of Texas. With his death, however, uh, President Johnson had to co contemplate a totally different circumstance. Without a trial, there would be no accepted way by which the American public and the world at large could learn what the facts were regarding the association, perhaps discern whether there were any associates, and perhaps learn something more about what motivated this, uh, uh, shall we say, a minor uh, uh, actor in the history of the United States uh, who became a major uh, feature in our history by virtue of the success of the assassination. So President Johnson had to confront the fact that there were uh, two contemplated investigations in the state of Texas. There were at least two congressional investigations that were being considered. And in order to defer uh, these conflicting and obviously competing assassinations with uh, investigations, uh, he decided to appoint a presidential uh, a commission. Uh, after Warren and the members had been uh, uh, selected, uh, they, they, they met for three occasions in, in December 1963, and they made uh, uh, two uh, critical uh, uh, decisions. Uh, uh, one, uh, they decided they could not rely on the reports of the FBI or any other investigative agency. They had to conduct their own independent investigation. Secondly, in order to do that, they needed a staff. They selected a former Solicitor General of the United States, J. Lee Rankin, a Republican from Nebraska who had served in the Justice Department for eight years under the Eisenhower administration. He had served as Solicitor General and had argued many cases in the Supreme Court, so he was well known to, and, and re respected by the, by the Chief Justice. On December 17th, the, I was called into my boss's office. It appeared that the Deputy Attorney General, Nick Katzenbach, who had attended these meetings of the Commission uh, after Rankin was appointed and attended a meeting on the 16th of December, uh, Nick Katzenbach apparently told Rankin and, and the Chief Justice that he would try to find a, a warm-bodied person to come over and help. Uh, the commission get organized and staffed. Uh, I was the person that was selected 
uh, to go over on the 17th to meet with Lee Rankin, meet with the Chief Justice uh, about uh, my availability to help them do whatever they wanted me to do. So the Chief Justice was very pointed in uh, uh, explaining why he had been reluctant to accept this job, uh, how committed he was to do a good job and to find out the facts, and that he did not want anyone from the government working on the staff. He wanted to have a staff of independent lawyers and others uh, who would come with no preconception, no loyalty to any state or federal agency that would uh, perhaps influence their judgment as to what the facts were and what the commission's conclusion should be. You know, so uh, after a few weeks of working with Lee Rankin, he told his secretary uh, that he wanted me to get a copy of every outgoing document that went from his office including all the investigative requests to the agencies, letters to Congress, and all the other miscellany uh, that you generate in organizing an investigation of this, of, of, of this kind. So in addition to these uh, files, which I have collect, collected and maintained over the years, I also wrote a day-by-day -day journal, which was written not very religiously and not very eloquently, uh, but uh, was dictated periodically uh, to reflect on paper what I was doing uh, what I was arguing about with my colleagues on the staff, what the commission was doing, and together the journal and my chronological files with the raw materials on which I decided to write this book after so many years. I did so for two principal reasons. One, I thought it was a matter of historical record uh, that there be at least an effort by someone who lived through this experience uh, to tell the public uh, uh, and, and people in the future who we were, what our problems were, how we handled them, what our convictions were and what our findings were at the end of the nine-month investigation. The investigation was the most extensive criminal investigation ever conducted in the United States. Uh, the commission uh, heard testimony from 94 witnesses under oath. Uh, lawyers from the commission took depositions of another 395. In total, some 552 witnesses contributed their thoughts and recollections uh, to the uh, commission, and it's on the basis of those sworn uh, uh, statements uh, that the findings of the commission uh, are, are based. Uh, the, the second reason I wanted to write the book was that there is so much criticism over the years and distrust in the work of the Warren Commission that I thought that people who are coming to the issue with a relatively open mind uh, might want to know not only what the Warren Commission did and what its findings were, but how have these findings survived over the nearly five decades since they were written? And the point is that the critical findings of the commission, first, that Oswald was the assassin and the killer of patrolman Tippett, but also that there was no credible evidence that he was associated in any way with the planning or execution of either the killing of the patrolman or the assassination of the president. So the question is, well, how have these findings survived over time? And in fact, critical findings like the analysis of the autopsy materials or the so-called magic bullet have been examined repeatedly in 1968 uh, by a panel appointed by Attorney General Ramsey Clark, in 1975 by a presidential commission to, uh, to investigate the illegal activities of the CIA, in 1976 by a Senate uh, a committee chaired by uh, Senator Church which investigated the role of the FBI and the CIA in, in the work of uh, the commission's investigation of, of the assassination. Then in 1978 and 79 by a, a House Select Committee on the assassinations of uh, Reverend King and President Kennedy, a committee appointed specifically to investigate all aspects of the, of the assassination of President Kennedy. And, and that committee confirmed our major uh, findings it did, I will say, in a footnote, uh, deviate with a, a, a totally uns uns unsubstantiated suggestion that there was a fourth shot from the grassy knoll. And for those of you who are uh, addicted to the grassy knoll, I'll be glad to respond to that in more detail. Uh, but the long sh and short of that was that their conclusion was based on some acoustics evidence. Uh, and two years later, was analyzed by a Harvard-appointed uh, uh, group from the uh, National Academy of Sciences was the sponsor of the effort, and it was headed by a Nobel Prize winner uh, from Harvard, and they concluded that the sound waves on the dictatape uh, that some experts, in quotes, uh, testified represented four shots, including one from the grassy knoll, and they certified that they were 95% certain that they could place the location of that second shooter within a 10-yard circle. Incredible testimony 
changed the subcommittee from a finding of no conspiracy to a finding of conspiracy. A fourth shot from the grassy knoll. Although there was no eyewitness testimony, there was no second rifle, there was no fourth bullet, there was no fourth cartridge. No one ever got hit in the limousine in Dealey Plaza or in the state of Texas, so far as anyone could d discern. So after that, that report was filed in 1982, all but the most committed conspiracy theorists gave up on the work of the Select Committee and the work of that professional staff represents some of the abuses that lawyers can inflict on their unsuspecting and not well endowed clients. So I thought that investigating and reporting on the future of the Warren Commission's findings and pointing out mistakes we made uh, and analyzing how significant those mistakes might have been. And as you might suspect, I concluded that our findings have remained intact uh, after nearly 50 years. And that's why I quote and use a quote from the Chief Justice uh, to title my book as history will prove us right. He assured one of my colleagues when he called up to complain about the trashing of the report by the conspiracy uh, community. And the Chief Justice said to his old friend, Joe Ball from California, Joe, be calm. History will prove us right. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so many questions we, we could address here, but you know, let's start with the most obvious one. You, you, you reference the most ardent conspiracy theorists out there, Oliver Stone. It, 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 has, to, it has to come up. Um, my, my, my recollection was that you were, in fact, in a hearing, am I correct, with Oliver Stone at one, some point addressing his, his conspiracy theories from everyone from the CIA to the mafia to President Johnson himself. And, and, um, and although the review board had characterized the film as largely fictional, it did endorse Stone's message in the closing trailer that Americans could not trust official public conclusions when those conclusions had been made in secret. Therefore, Congress had passed the JFK Act, which released secret records that prior, prior investigations had gathered and created. Can you tell us a little bit about your reactions, or, or, and yours as well, Mr. Swanson, to that, uh, to that movie and, and to members of Cong Congress, which I believe you've even referred to as obsequious in their, in their, uh, in their give and take with Oliver Stone? Well, it is, after the, the House Select Committee uh, issued its report in 1979, I, I think that there was some quieting of, of the conspiracy uh, community with respect to the work of the Warren Commission, but it clearly was given new life by Oliver Stone's movie in 1991 entitled uh, JFK. And of course it did uh, uh, involve a, a, a uh, dramatic description of, of two, two conspiracies, one a combination of intelligence uh, and, and defense people and, and villains from all sections of the world who conspired to commit the assassination, then a cover-up uh, which had its foundation in, in, in the White House. And, the, and he, he did conclude that the American people will never be satisfied until all the public records are, 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 are made available uh, about the works of all the committees and organizations investigating the assassination. So there was a proposed law to open up the files and, and discover new records that had not been released and make sure they were released. From the standpoint of the Warren Commission, by 1992, when these hearings took place, 98% of our materials were already uh, available uh, at the National Archives. And that was done because of, of special steps that the President took at the request of the Chief Justice in January of 1965 to overrule a long-standing National Archives uh, uh, regulation that records of investigative work would not become public for at least 50 years. So none of the House Select Committee's materials were available. So I was designated by the staff to go in and express our strong support for uh, the legislation because we had no concern about what was being withheld. Most of our stuff was out there, and we agreed that everything that had been withheld under national security grounds ought to be reexamined to see whether, in fact, it could be released. But when I followed Oliver Stone testified, and, and, and he was, as I do say, uh, he, the members of the committee in the largest hearing room I ever participated in uh, uh, supported the entire committee of some 22 people or whatever it was. There were more cameras there than I've ever seen in a single room in my, in my life. And I sat down at the far right end of the witness table because I didn't want to be the subject of all these cameras. I mean, who knows what my behavior would be under those circumstances. So I sat to the far right, but then to my dismay, Oliver Stone came in and sat at a very small table, only about six or eight feet in front of me. 
Now, at that point, all the cameras focused uh, uh, on Oliver Stone. And I'm sitting in the background trying to study my script and looking, you know, uh, insignificant. And, and, but there was this enormous parade of yes, tomorrow's most desirable model going up. There was a parade of beautiful young women going up to, to whisper in Oliver Stone's uh, ears. And it was most distracting. Uh, <laughs> and and, and the, the cameras featured on me uh, studying, my, studying my materials, but occasionally looking up. Uh, so when I followed him to the uh, uh, podium, uh, I, I was personally offended by the fact that the members of the committee never asked him, was there a factual basis for a conclusion as to either of his conspiracies? And of course there was none. But they were truly, what I described, they were obsequious to this man uh, to an extent that was truly uh, repulsive. Uh, and so when I stood up to defend the Warren Commission, I was younger then, but still of a respectable age, and uh, uh, I got harangued by the uh, chairman of the committee, uh, actually, uh, uh, who's, who recently may not be able to run for a re-election because he failed to fill out the rest of the necessary forms in the, in the state of Michigan, uh, John, John Connors, and he kept insisting that I had to have nagging doubts. Mr. Willens, you have nagging doubts about your conclusions. I said, no, you, no, Mr. Congressman, you know, I don't, but you know, Things in the future may bring up new information, but you have nagging doubts and so forth. And we had a very a strong exchange, uh, which went to was mutually unsatisfactory. But the, the point was that they they didn't really care what the facts were. Uh, the law was put in place. Uh, a board was appointed to uh, identify, search out uh, records uh, broadly defined that related to the assassination. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of new documents were placed in the National Archives as a result. Not one smoking gun was found. And people ask how many documents are still being withheld, and my estimate, what I hear, is something around 1,700, under 2,000. And they have to be made public by 2017, unless the President of the United States personally concludes that a document cannot be released because there are overriding public interests justifying its being uh, withheld. So that's the status, and we can all wonder what's in those 1,700 documents. And my good friend here, Mr. Swanson, may be able to tell us. Well, Howard made an interesting point. When he uses the word facts, the Stone movie facts, here's what I've learned writing this book and meeting with audiences, going to book festivals around the country, being on television. The majority of the American people, according to recent polling, believe that there was a conspiracy behind the murder of the president. If you're willing to do it, how many people here believe there was a conspiracy of some kind? Raise your hands. Huh? I've discovered this, and Howard has discovered this. We, we talked about this at dinner last night. Unless you're one of the super buffs who reads all the books and writes them, most people who claim they believe in a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy do not even know some of the basic facts about the crime. Most people who tell you they believe in a conspiracy can't tell you how many shots were fired. They can't tell you which shots hit the president. They don't know that Oswald ordered that rifle with a form with his own handwriting on it. That when Oswald was captured, he had a fake ID card on him that matched the fake name he used to order the rifle. They don't know that Oswald was seen carrying a package, a paper bag, to work that morning by at least two witnesses that matched perfectly the size of the rifle broken down into two major pieces, that he was the only person who vanished from the Texas School Book Depository after the assassination, that he went home to his boarding house and got a pistol and within an hour murdered a Dallas policeman, and when he was captured and the pistol was taken from him, it matched the bullets that killed the policeman, that Oswald also ordered that pistol with a form that could be uh, traced to him. That's the tip of the iceberg of the evidence against Oswald. That's just the most obvious basic evidence. But people say there were conspiracies and they ask us to prove that the conspiracy didn't happen. That's not a method of rational argument. How can you prove a negative? Let them disprove the facts I've just stated. Hundreds of other facts. That, that Howard could tell you. They looked at so much. Here's one thing we talked about last night, and we laughed about it. Oswald took a bus to Mexico City before he killed the president. He was there for a few days. The Warren Commission even tracked down British tourists 
who rode the bus with Oswald to Mexico City, found out that Oswald had eaten a banana, and they, they started investigating all the shops where Oswald could have stopped on the way to eat the banana. Do you know that uh, about 10 witnesses saw the rifle barrel pointing out the sixth floor window? People watched the barrel as Oswald opened fire. They could see the barrel tracking the car. They could see the, sh the shooting. Do you know that men in the motorcade, the journalist, a few cars behind the president, said, somebody's shooting a rifle. Another journalist said, look, it's right up there. They saw it in the window. There were three employees of the book depository who were sitting in the fifth floor windows looking out, watching the motorcade. Oswald was right above their heads. They heard three times, bang, bang, bang. They heard above their heads the ejected cartridges from the rifle bounce on the floor above their heads. Debris came down on their heads. The men said to each other, hey, somebody's shooting right above our heads. They could hear the building shaking, the window frame shaking. Anyone who says the shots three were not fired from the sixth floor window of the book depository has got to be nuts. <laughs> Look at all the people who saw the rifle, who saw it shooting, who heard the shots, people standing in front of the building. The man who drove Oswald to work that morning, unknowingly with the rifle in the car, was standing in front watching the motorcade. He hears the shots, he looks up, and he sees the barrel pointing out the window. Uh, people saw it from all different angles. These are facts that are forgotten. And I find that, that uh, most of the critics I know have never even read the Warren Commission. They've never read it. Uh, Howard and I might be the only people you'll ever meet in your lives who have read the whole thing. And it's gigantic. It's the one, it's the one report of almost 1,000 pages, but then it's 26 supporting volumes. There are hundreds of facts that point to Oswald. There are thousands of facts that they uncovered that do not point to conspiracy. So when, when the conspiracists say to someone like Howard, who was there, or to the reporter, everyone involved, prove that it wasn't a conspiracy, I would tell them, prove that he was wrong, prove that the commission was wrong, prove that the brief facts that I just mentioned to you are wrong. As J Jackie Kennedy said it best, the night of the assassination, she was at the, at the autopsy and the bombing, and, and she said to her mother, I can't believe it. It was just some silly little communist. That's who it was. You know, I, I should point out that, you know, we've got two authors, two books on the same subject here. But for you, this should not be a decision on which book should I go with. Because th the fact is, they both somehow tell this story with the same conclusion, but from very different perspectives. Howard, of course, it, it, where in the position he was in with, as he said, with, with facts and, 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 um, and interviews and, and, and depositions and, and, and months and months worth of research that went into this. And Mr. Swanson, this book is remarkable in that you're reading it almost like you're there. I mean, in the months and days leading up to it, the day it occurred, conversations that happened between eyewitnesses, between Oswald and his wife, um, uh, from, from Jackie Kennedy herself. Um, my question for you is, how did you get so much information about, I mean, such level of detail from events 50, 60 years ago or more? Well, in all of my books, I never put within quotation marks something that does not exist in one or multiple sources. Uh, never. Uh, I'll give you an example. How do I know that uh, in his hotel room in Fort Worth, the president said to Jackie, first, Jackie, it, it, it was so crowded when we got here last night. It was raining. It was crowded. The, the crowd was pressing in on us. A man could have taken a pistol from a briefcase and shot me. And another thing, he could, someone could shoot me from a rifle. We know that because the Irish Mafia was in the room. Jackie was in the room. Jackie told that story to the historian William Manchester in the mid-1960s. That's how I know. How do we know what Oswald said during his police interrogations? We don't know everything that was said because, uh, foolishly in my opinion, the Dallas police did not record their 12 hours of interrogation of Oswald. But through letters, transcripts, reminiscences, books, uh, contemporary exchanges at the time between law enforcement, people who were there, we can reconstruct some of what Oswald said. So I only put in the book 
what multiple sources confirm that Oswald talked about, uh, especially on a book fraught, on a subject fraught with such controversy. I was determined that if, if I could get away with it, I would not make a single factual mistake in the book. Uh, I don't know if I have or not. Uh, the conspiracists have written that I've made hundreds of mistakes, but I know I did not. Uh, maybe it was 12.01 and not 12.02 p.m., but I, I tried religiously not to put anything in the book that I could not somehow verify. Speaking of mistakes, you mentioned the, the Dallas Police Department and failing to record the interview. It, it sounds from what I'm reading here that there were just not countless mistakes, but a lot of mistakes that perhaps are driving some of these conspiracy theories. Fr from the CIA to the Secret Service to the FBI to Dallas Police's um, um, t terrible protection of Lee Harvey Oswald when they brought him out. Are, are, are some of the conspiracy theories, if, if not supported, but bolstered by some of the missteps in thinking that these were cover-ups by these folks for, for a, an assassination plot, or is that that they were covering up mistakes that they made along the way? If you're understanding what I'm asking here, was there a conspiracy to kill the president, or was there more of a conspiracy to cover up the mistakes they made leading up to that day? Yes, I, I think it certainly it certainly is is the latter. Uh, uh, the, the point is, we were dealing with three three very important uh, institutions uh, during our investigation. We were dealing with the FBI, which we learned years later had a good deal to hide. We were dealing with the CIA that refused to uh, advise us. Uh, uh, at the time about the assassination plots directed at Castro that they had developed during the years 1960 to 1963. Uh, and we had the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Douglas Dillon, uh, under whose jurisdiction the Secret Service Agency was then located. And the Secret Service, of course, had failed dismally in their effort to protect the President. And one of our goals was the forward-looking one of trying to investigate their policies and practices to see how they could be improved in order to prevent you know, another assassination. So we were dealing with these three entrenched institutions, and that was a special challenge that I was engaged in in all three of those uh, arenas. The most important uh, uh, piece of that that I would like to mention to you, uh, too, the, the whole role of the CIA was investigated 10 years later in some detail by the Select Committee. Uh, and, and they uh, interviewed about 50 witnesses who uh, gave them detailed information about the history of the CIA's interest in Oswald once he uh, uh, returned to the United States. Uh, and and the, that committee was satisfied. There was no evidence in the records or from the testimony by CIA employees, past or present, that the CIA had any interest in Oswald other than as uh, someone that they ought to follow. Uh, because of the potential connections he might have uh, with Soviet agents or other uh, Cuban uh, agents. Uh, but the one story I want to tell is the fact of Agent James Hostie, who had the responsibility for managing the FBI investigation of Oswald after Oswald returned to the Dallas uh, area after some uh, months in, in uh, uh, New Orleans. And Hostie had the file, and he went out to interview Ruth Payne, the nice Quaker lady who had taken in Marina Oswald, the wife, and now two very young daughters, uh, because Lee Harvey Oswald was living in a rooming house in Dallas, uh, but his wife and were living and children were living with Ruth Payne in the suburb of Irving, Irving, Texas. So uh, Agent Hosty went to visit Ruth Payne to find out where Oswald worked and where he lived. And he interviewed her on uh, November, uh, November 1, 19, uh, 19 uh, uh, September, what was it? It was in November, November 1, 19, 1963. And he came back on November 5. He now knew where Oswald worked, but he did not know where Oswald lived. And, in, and on the second visit, uh, Marina Oswald came into the room, and Agent Hosty had a very brief exchange uh, with uh, 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 Mrs. Oswald, who was, of course, concerned that any law enforcement person would be like the KGB and was going to put her in jail. So anyway, uh, Oswald was offended by that visit, and he wrote a note signed, I believe, in an envelope which he delivered to the FBI office in Dallas about a week later. The date's a little uncertain. It might have been around November 12, 1963. And in the note was destroyed on November 24 after Ruby killed uh, 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 Oswald. So all we have as to what the note said depends on the testimony of two people 
when this became public in 1975. And the receptionist, being a diligent, active receptionist, opened the unsealed envelope, which had Hostie's name on the envelope, and her testimony went something like this when asked, well, what did the note say? She, she recalled, she said, let, let this be a warning. If you don't stop bothering my wife, I'm going to blow up the police department and the FBI office. So signed, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, Agent Hostie testified somewhat differently. He said it was not signed by Oswald, and he never knew it was from Oswald until he met Oswald during the interrogation on November 22. And Hostie says it was something like this. The note, Oswald wrote, according to Hostie, if you want information from me, please count me directly. Uh, please do not contact my wife, otherwise I will take appropriate action through the proper authorities. So between the two versions, I, I think perhaps each was perhaps a little uh, uh, overemphasized one point or another. I think the receptionist uh, interpretation was probably more accurate, and this was a threatening note written by this alleged assassin two weeks before the assassination took place. I suggest to you two modest conclusions uh, from this event. First, that Oswald had no intention of assassinating the president uh, two weeks before he did so, even as part of, uh, whether as part of a conspiracy or by himself. And secondly, if Hosey had done his job and interviewed Oswald, there would probably have been no assassination. I could continue to ask questions, but with time getting short, are there questions the audience would like to ask our authors? <clears throat> This is kind of a weird question, but <clears throat> are there any, if we suspected and, and in fact, in, as far as we're concerned, proved that the Soviet government had been behind this, can you, can either one of you or both of you comment on whether we would have found that they did because of the problems it would bring up in the world? I just, I just wonder about that because uh, we have, I've read a book recently about Lincoln assassination. It was, a, it was a fictional book, but they believed, a historical fiction, but, but they believed that the Confederate government had, was somehow backed the assassination of Lincoln. And if they had gone ahead and taken action in regard to that, we would have been in a mess similar to what I believe we would have been if we'd have proved that the Soviet government had been behind it. This raises two interesting points. The mention of the Lincoln assassination, possibly Confederate conspiracy. I'm not saying you believe this, but, but, but uh, uh, if, the, if the Soviet uh, government was involved. And Howard, uh, I don't believe any of the conspiracy theories, but I believe the case arguing that it was the Soviets is one of the weakest of all the conspiracy theories. Uh, if the President of the United States had seen evidence that the Soviet Union had ordered the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and if the American people had learned of that fact, there might have been an, an outcry. Uh, the, the theory is, yes, we knew it was the Russians, but we couldn't tell the American people because they would have demanded a nuclear war against the Soviets and 50 million Americans would have died. It's a hypothetical question. Howard knew, knew more of the people involved then, so maybe you'd like to speculate, but uh, what, the question is, you know, what, what would have America's, would have America have concealed that it was the Soviets if they knew it was in order to avoid a nuclear war? Well. Uh, I have just, just, I guess, two points to make. Uh, Secretary uh, Dean Russ, Secretary of State, testified before the, uh, the commission, and he was very eloquent in stating the fact that, that Khrushchev and, and President Kennedy, despite their differences earlier in Kennedy's uh, uh, term, you know, had reached sort of a, a meeting of the minds, recognizing that two, the two of them shared some responsibility uh, for the stability of, of, of the world. And they recognized this incredible responsibility and, and they had many means of communication that they had developed uh, behind, behind the scenes uh, that reassured uh, Secretary Russ that there was absolutely no Soviet uh, interest that could have been served by supporting any kind of an assassination. Now, if, as uh, 
James is suggesting you, you, you raise as a proper question, what would have happened if? All I can say is this, that, that I, I can speak for members of the staff more than I can uh, uh, the uh, uh, members of the commission, but I, I don't think there was a, a member of the staff uh, that would have uh, uh, agreed to non-disclosure uh, of a conclusions reached of that kind. And that was one of the reasons why, actually, uh, to go back to where I began this conversation, the Chief Justice said he wanted people from outside the government. I mean, you know, I had an old Michigan University of Michigan colleague from Des Moines, Iowa, from the private practice. I had a distinguished criminal lawyer from, you know, San Diego. I had a man who went on to be the, the, the dean of the Stanford Law School, the dean of, the, uh, the, uh, the, the dean of NYU Law School, uh, two, three judges around the country, a five-term senator from Pennsylvania, my classmate from Yale, Ireland, Specter. I mean, these, these were people of substance. And they made, some of them were younger than others, to be sure. But they all were united in the fact that whatever was to be found, it was going to be reported. And many of them wanted to find a conspiracy uh, out of patriotism and perhaps self-interest as well. As one of my friends from Ohio said, if I discovered a conspiracy, I would have been in the Senate instead of John Glenn. In, in any event, that, that sort of that may trivialize the, the concerns and the motives, but the facts were there. These were people of substance who had a commitment to tell the truth. And I agree with you absolutely. It would have been an unbelievably, you know, intolerable situation and how to handle it. But they, we, we, we would have found a way to do that. And, and just to add to, to Howard's point, uh, my mentor in law school, Wesley J. Liebler, served on the Warren Commission with Howard. Jim had always told me, we all wanted to find the conspiracy. It, we would have been famous worldwide. We, we were aggressively hoping we were going to find that kind of evidence. Regarding the Russians, of course, just so it's clear, we don't think there was a Russian conspiracy. Why? The Cuban Missile Crisis was long behind us. The invasion of Cuba was. JFK and the Soviets had just signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. For what purpose to eliminate Kennedy? As Oswald said under questioning, why assassinate Kennedy? He'll be replaced by someone who's going to carry out the same policies. So the Russians as far as I can tell, had no interest whatsoever in assassinating John Kennedy. Thank you for the question. We've got probably time for one more. I, your turn. Uh, I was just a kid also when that all happened, but later on talked to my dad before he died. He was a big into labor and all this. He always thought organized crime and labor had something to do with Ruby being shot. Uh, was that ever followed up on in the commission about the, any role in organized crime? Or well, Ruby was never labor? shot. You just asked if organized crime was involved with Ruby being shot. Ruby died of cancer in prison. He wasn't shot. Wasn't he the gentleman that was killed in the Dallas police station? Well, Ruby killed Oswald. Yeah. I'm sorry. Howard, you want to? Yeah, yeah let, let me just uh, say, yes, the, the role of, investi of organized crime was very carefully investigated by the select committee in 1978-79. At that time, they had the, the, the tapes of several years of illegal surveillance by the FBI of organized crime. I mean, I was in the Justice Department under Bob Kennedy in the division that was dealing with organized crime. We did not know about those surveillance tapes, at least the substance of them at the time, but the, the 12 years later, it was looked at very carefully and an expert in organized crime testified that there was no evidence of any interest whatsoever. Well, let's put it this way. The, the leaders of organized crime would be very glad to have the president and his brother killed. Let, let's be clear. Uh, but there was evident that they saw no uh, just risk and that it would be the moment a, a serious mistake for anyone in organized crime to take uh, such an action. Uh, did he want fame? Anyone who killed President Kennedy would live forever. Oswald, we know, always wanted to do something important, even though he lived a miserable common life of no achievement. He wanted to be part of history. Or here's something we don't think about anymore because we don't think it exists. Is it this simple? Was Oswald evil? Was he an evil man who did an evil thing? Uh, I don't think we'll ever know why he did it. Uh, we only know that he did. Agreed. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone.